I can't resist telling you this, but the very first time that I made a programme for ITV, must have been about 10 or 12 years ago, it started here in the grounds of Belsay Hall, just outside Newcastle. It was a lovely summer's morning and I'd arrived early and I stood here watching the camera crew's white van as it slowly drove up the approach road towards the hall. I was so nervous, I'd never met the crew before and I'd heard that they can be a bit rough and common ITV camera crews, so I didn't know what to expect. Now, as it happens, they were lovely. Within seconds, there was a coffee poured out and Bickies had appeared and the cameraman was already off taking pictures because you've got to nail ITV cameraman down if you want to stop them taking pics. Soundmen are no better, especially in places like this. Once they get those cans over their ears, they're lost in a little private world of birdies tweeting in far-off bushes. So this is where it started for me, and this is how it's carried on. Spent quite a lot of the intervening years pottering about the beautiful grounds of posh country houses all over the north. Somebody's got to do it. This programme's supposed to be about northern architecture and I suspect that it's possible to look at this place and ask what's so northern about that? It's inspired by the architecture of ancient Greece for heaven's sake. The gardens are beautiful but you can find stuff like that all over the country. So what makes that northern? Hmm? Answer that Grundy. Well first of all it's built of beautiful northern stone. Honey coloured northern sandstone. And secondly, it was designed by a northern chap. In 1804, the owner, Sir Charles Monk, went on a two-year honeymoon down through Europe to the Mediterranean and all points southern. And he came back with two things that had been conceived in Greece. There was a baby called Atticus, splendid Grecian name, and there were the designs for his new house. And of course it's northern because he built it in the north in this beautiful northern landscape and it can act as a reminder that the north contains country house architecture as good as it's possible to find anywhere and that's not just true of Belsay. got country houses that good in the north, why bother to go anywhere else, eh? But there's one final way in which this estate is a particularly northern experience. And to reveal that, I need to show you the house that Sir Charles Monk abandoned when he went off on his mega honeymoon. He was a skion, I think that's the word I'm looking for, a skion of an ancient family called the Middletons, which had lived here at Belsay since the 13th century. And for hundreds of years, until Sir Charles decided to build himself something fashionably Greek over there, they'd lived here at Belsay Castle. Belsay Castle is an entirely northern house because it illustrates perfectly what rich northerners did when the wars against Scotland finally came to an end and they no longer felt the need to hide away in castles. The war ended in 1603 when Scotland and England were joined together under one king and here at Belsay in 1614 the Middletons built themselves a nice comfy house to add to the accommodation in their spiffy medieval tower. At Chillingham Castle in North Northumberland they kept the whole castle standing but stuck a new front on with classical columns and things and added a sort of fancy bit in the courtyard. Lumley Castle in County Durham was gradually turned into a magnificent mansion without really changing any of the castle walls, just new windows and renaissance features in the courtyard. But Chipchase Castle in North Tyndale is one of my favourites. Tyndale was one of the most dangerous places in England in the 14th century. 
One bit of it was described in 1315 as now worth nothing because it lies waste and destroyed by the Scots. A hundred years later, an Italian called Aeneas Silvius was sent by the Pope on a mission to Scotland and he travelled up Tyndale, which he described as uninhabitable, horrible and uncultivated. A bit harsh, you think, huh? It looks nice enough now, but in those days it seems to have been a vile place, violent and lawless, and one of the castles built to control it was Chipchase. Chipchase is a huge 14th century castle with all of the trimmings. Those turrets sticking out at the corners are called Bartizans. They've been corbelled out to make them stand proud of the wall. I don't know whether that was for defensive purposes or just to make them look good, but it certainly does make them look good. The way those battlements stick out from the wall is called machicolation, which is one of my favourite words, so I'm going to say it again. Machicolation. And that's definitely for defensive purposes, so that you could drop loathsome substances down on the heads of attackers. Those other sticky outy bits were also a source of loathsome substances, because those were the shoots from the guard robes or toilets, and that would certainly scare the Scots away. The entrance still has its portcullis. Now, how rare is that? Very rare is the answer. That is a remarkable survival. But this is a remarkable tower. It's big and splendid, but it's not clear whether it stood alone or whether there were other buildings attached to it. There certainly are now. This facade looks Georgian now, early 1700s, but it's probably much older in its masonry. You can still see blocked older windows if you look carefully. And the south front is Jacobean, 1621. Just a few years after England and Scotland joined together, the Herons, who owned Chip Chase, had the confidence to build the first full-scale, non castly house in this whole area. Isn't that a tremendous combination? Castle and house. Peace was such a rarity up here near the border that in those early days of country houses, nobody was going to let go of their castle. But they were looking towards the future too, and so they produced these wonderful romantic combinations, war and peace. Meanwhile, over in Lancashire, something very different indeed was happening. In Lancashire, there is a great group of extraordinary timber framed houses. This one's called Horlith Wood, and it's in Bolton. Now I know that there are lots of timber framed houses in other parts of England, but you can forget about your pretty mellow villagey stuff of southern England. These are different. There's something almost mythological about them. They're black and white and timber framed with a relish and an exuberance that has to be seen to be believed. They're like houses from the Black Forest going wild on holiday. They've got millions of gables and overhanging eaves and scores of huge but irregular windows. They stick out and leap back again as if they can't contain themselves. I know that's not a very architectural description, but cool description doesn't do houses like this any sort of justice. There's a wild and a dramatic energy about them, a startling playfulness that has to be seen to be believed. Some of them are almost as exuberant inside. In fact, Rufford Old Hall near Ormskirk is even more so. It's extraordinary. It's, oh, do you know, I've run out of words. In terms of timber work, there's nothing I can think of in England that's like it. The Great Hall is almost overpowering. It has an enormous hammer beam roof with carved angels, and all of the gaps between the main timbers of the walls are filled with traceried infills. There's a gigantic movable screen with some of the most barbaric carved figures in English art. It really is amazing. It's a room in which you can imagine giants throwing back buckets of foaming ale and thwacking their thighs noisily. Where on earth they came from, these marvellous Lancashire wooden monsters, I don't know, but they're just the pinnacle of the pile. 
The North as a whole came out of the violence of medieval times, later and with less certainty than further south, and until the end of the 17th century there is an intensity about northern country houses which sets them apart from the common English run. There isn't exactly a northern style, just a northern feeling. Lytham Hall, not a million miles from Blackpool, not ten miles from Blackpool in fact, but a very different sort of atmosphere. It was built by Sir Cuthbert Clifton in 1757. It's a Palladian house, a style of Georgian architecture typical of the middle of the 18th century. It's nine bays or nine windows wide, the middle three bays made especially grand with a pediment and attached ionic columns. The ground floor windows are given a bit of extra importance by having posh, heavily detailed surrounds called gib surrounds. This is a super house. The details are nice and refined. The colours lovely. In fact, it's so perfect, it almost looks like a doll's house. As a piece of architecture, it gives, I believe, general satisfaction. Now I want to have a whinge at this point, a good northern moan because these local chaps hardly ever get a mention in the national books on architecture. John Carr gets the occasional notice because he's too good to ignore, but even when they mention him, do you know, this drives me wild. They tend to call him John Carr of York, as if there are loads of John Carrs to choose from. Now, call me paranoid, but I suspect that they do this because Southerners find it surprising that somebody as good as him should come from somewhere as remote as the North. Oh. Anyway, that's my whinge over and it's time to go into this very nice house by John Carr of York. Georgian country houses all over England can be decorated with quite fabulous richness inside and the North is no different. They tend to be awash with fancy plaster work, which was often done by Italian fancy plasterers who were known as Stuccatori. The Italian for plaster is stucco, and there were gangs of these Stuccatori roaming all over the north, which makes them seem somehow frightfully menacing, like gangsters or brigands. Beware the Stuccatori nostra. But they did incredible work. In Northumberland there was a gang led by Pietro La Francini, who settled in the village of Cambo, north of Newcastle. There was another group under Francesco Vesali, but this stuff at Lytham was done by a rival gang, led by a man called Giuseppe Cortesi. The Cortesi, my boss, they'll have you plastered if you don't watch out. Now, plaster work of this quality is to be found all over the north, so here's a few examples from around the region. As luck would have it, the plasterwork in this house wasn't done by Italian Stuccatori, but by an Englishman. Indeed, he was a northerner called Joseph Rose, Joseph Rose of York, actually. But this painting was by an Italian, a man called Biagio Rebecca, of whom I've never heard. I hope I've got it right, and it's not by some girly painter called Rebecca Biagio. I don't think it is, but I couldn't swear to it. It's fantastic anyway, and it was done in 1772. This house is called Heaton Hall, and it's in Manchester, and the painting is in the Etruscan style, which was fantastically fashionable at exactly that time, as indeed the whole house was. In 1772, this house was real avant-garde stuff. It wouldn't have looked out of place in London or in the home counties. 
It was built for a northern aristocrat called Sir Thomas Egerton, who was raking in dosh in bucket loads because there was coal underneath his land, and anyway, he had a hugely wealthy wife. I wish I had one of those. So, with all of this money at his disposal, he decided to call in a very fashionable London architect called James Wyatt to build him this outstandingly elegant house. This is the neoclassical style to perfection. Such a beautiful design. But of course, it's not northern at all. It's a bit like Belsay where I started this programme, in that it's not northern in any stylistic way. It's not even really English. It's European. By the end of the 18th century, it's difficult to say that there's any sort of northern style in country houses. But at least when you come to somewhere as fine as Heaton Hall, you can say that we've got some of the best of them. So just by way of a reminder, here's a little group of the North's Georgian glories. Finally, as they say, the Victorians, the 19th century. In the 19th century, there was a big change in the world of the country house. They began to be built by people who'd made new money out of commerce and industry and inventiveness. There were hundreds of them, and once they'd made a fortune, they liked nothing more than to spend it on the sort of country houses that would give them a taste of the old aristocratic life. I know what you're thinking. You can't hide it from me. You're thinking industrialists, self-made men. I bet they all built big, vulgar, tasteless houses full of flashy tat. Well, on the whole, that wasn't the case. And to prove it, I've brought you here, to Cragside, the house begun in the 1870s by the great Tyneside inventor and industrialist William Armstrong, Lord Armstrong as he became. I think that this is my favourite country house. The entirely amazing thing about Cragside is that, unlike most of us, it's got everything. Landscape and contents, all spiffing enough for anybody, but on top of all of that, it has the most interesting technological history of any country house anywhere. Cue the Siemens Generator. Early attempts at creating electric light independent on battery power, which as we torch owners know is notoriously short-lived. But in the 1870s, 1878 I think, the German-British inventor William Siemens invented the electrical generator. Now our chum Lord Armstrong bought one. I have to tell you that this isn't it. The original was replaced by this one, which is a Crompton generator in 1886. But what Lord Armstrong did with this one and with the original was to drive it, to make it go using water from one of his many lakes. And then he went on to use the resultant electricity to power electrical arc lights in the house, which makes Cragside the first house in the world to be lit by hydroelectric power. Time for me to zoom off to the house. Another thing that no longer exists is that collection of 1878 arc lights, because they were replaced in December 1880 by these lamps made to hold Joseph Swan's incandescent lamp bulbs, a much brighter and more reliable source of light.
There were about 40 of these lights in the house overall, each producing 60 candle power or 120 watts. By today's standards, that's not a lot of light for a house this size. But people used to the dark ages couldn't get over the brilliance. Cragside is a truly northern experience. It's set with wonderful romance among the wild beauty of the northern hills. It's got a tower like the great late medieval houses of the borders. It's even got timber framing. Well, we saw plenty of that among those extraordinary mansions in Lancashire. But overall, it's a magnificent combination of industrial power, inventiveness and beauty. That sounds like the north to me.